support living greener. I'm meteorologist Caitlin McGrath. You hear us say it all the time, our environment matters. It's a mission we here at WUSA 9 truly believe in. So we've put together some great resources to help you live a greener life. I truly believe that all of our individual actions do add up and can really make a difference in protecting our planet. So we're going to break it up into three topics. Life at home, ways you can make your home more environmentally friendly and conserve energy. Food, how your diet impacts our climate. What you can do to reduce the amount of food waste you produce. And what to do with your food waste to help give back to the environment. We're also going to talk travel, the best ways to get around to reduce your carbon footprint. And how you can be a little more environmentally conscious when you do inevitably have to hop in the car. Let's start with your home. Whether you live in a city apartment or suburban single family home, there are steps you can take to make your home more energy efficient. And not only can you make your house greener, you can save yourself some green at the same time. Meteorologist Chester Lampkin shows us how. As the weather heats up, a lot of homeowners look for ways to improve energy efficiency in their homes and to save on electric bills. Now a new loan program can help you cut energy costs as we head into the summer months. This loan program helps bridge the gap for them so they can get the energy improvements uh, without having the upfront cash to, to pay for it. The Clean Energy Advantage program is a pilot program in the state of Maryland and Washington, D.C. In Maryland, it's part of the larger Empower program, which aims to lower carbon emissions in the state by increasing home energy efficiency. The idea was to actually help the utilities and contractors achieve goals for energy efficiency in homes. So the program itself is a loan program that is set with 0% interest for the first 12 months, as well as fixed terms thereafter, so that homeowners can take advantage of the rebates and incentives that are out there. For DC residents, the loan terms and rebates are slightly different. Still, there's room for savings on a variety of work that qualifies for the loan program and rebates from your energy providers. Anything from insulation to air sealing to HVC service and installs, we do the whole, the whole gambit. Anything that will make your house more efficient or comfortable. For homeowners that are looking to do these types of projects, you really should be starting with your contractor. A lot of people need to find a contractor that participates with one of the utility rebate programs. First, you'll want to get a home energy audit. It takes about three hours and costs about $100. We do a thorough visual inspection of the whole house from top to bottom. We're looking for insulation levels, air leaks, duct leaks, the efficiency of heating and cooling equipment. We do some diagnostic testing like a blower door fan to see how leaky your house is. Mm -hmm. We basically come up with a list of everything that we can do to your house to make it more efficient. We check that through all the rebate programs, incentives, tax credits, and we figure out what you can get back if you do the improvements and then what all of it's going to cost you. And in, in many, many cases, yeah, people are saving five, six hundred dollars a year on their electric bills. And so, yeah, you spend a hundred dollars and you got six hundred back for the first year. It makes sense. And that's just one resource you can turn to when it comes to making your home more efficient. D.C., Maryland and Virginia all have a number of residential conservation programs ready to help. For a full list of them, just visit our WUSA 9 app or WUSA9.com. A few other ways you can conserve energy in your home include turning your lights off when you leave a room, switch to energy efficient appliances, swap out light bulbs for LED lights, make sure you unplug devices when you're not using them, use smart automated devices where you can, and wash your clothes in cold water. And you can also go solar, and I know that that can come with a hefty price tag, but the DC Department of Energy and Environment is making clean energy more accessible through their Solar for All program. Michaela Lucera tell us, tells us all about it. I mean, it's been a tremendous help to myself and others in, in, in this building. Samuel Bugs is a resident and board member at Jubilee Housing, a nonprofit dedicated to providing deeply affordable housing to those on a fixed income. I really can't express how important it is for me personally. He and his neighbors get 50% off their Pepco electric bills thanks to the DC Department of Energy and Environment's Solar for All program. The extra, the 40, $50 that we're saved each month from our electric bill, it allows me to buy at least two, three meals for that particular week. And that's a blessing. Jubilee Housing got into the solar world a couple of years ago as a way to help and give back to the residents. This is just another way to provide some economic benefits for residents who are, just don't have a lot of spending power. And, and they have not seen their, their income raised as, um, as, as other costs have gone up. The Solar for All program is a partnership between DC, Jubilee Housing, Pepco, and New Partners Community Solar. It enables people who can't 
have their own solar arrays to still benefit from this new green economy and not be left behind as the nation moves forward. Here's how it works. Solar arrays are installed on space that's donated, like this rooftop at Pepco's headquarters. Power is generated and diverted to benefit low-income housing residents. So we're a neighbor first. We're a partner of the community. We live in the communities we serve, and we, we'd love to have um, this as part of our, our legacy. Thanks to a Pepco grant, Jubilee Housing also has the first of its kind resiliency room. When the power goes out, these solar powered battery packs bring life saving power to residents. If the electricity goes out, I'm in a world of trouble. I have a nebulizer machine that needs to be plugged up. We're grateful because, again, without it, our lives would be different. Our lives would certainly be different. I'm meteorologist Michaela Lucero, WUSA 9. The global food system accounts for up to a third of greenhouse gas emissions every year. And while there are systemic changes that need to be made at a level well above most people's heads, we can make the choice in our everyday diet that reduces our carbon footprint. Now, I can't stand here and act like I don't love a good steak or throwing burgers on the grill. I absolutely do. But I have made changes in the frequency in which I indulge in certain foods, and I hope you will too. So let's break down what it is about food production and consumption that is so bad for the environment. Greenhouse gases are emitted in the process of growing, raising, farming, processing, and transporting the food we eat. These greenhouse gases make up a food's carbon footprint. Different foods have different carbon footprints. Typically animal products have a higher footprint than plant-based products. What you're looking at here are the greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram of a food product. Emissions are measured in carbon dioxide equivalents. Beef produces nearly 100 times more carbon than beans. To learn more about our human impact on growing food, I visited the United States Botanic Garden exhibit called Cultivate, Growing Food in a Changing World. Check it out. Agriculture impacts everyone's life every day and the United States Botanic Garden has a long history of agriculture. We wanted to take that, that original idea of the founding of the United States Botanic Garden and look at it from a modern perspective, modern agriculture. And so the idea for Cultivate was born. The exhibit highlights the science and technology of growing food, cultural connections to growing food, and the stories of those involved with farming. As soon as you walk into the East Wing, you're greeted with a display that's both beautiful and educational, teaching visitors on how corn is used in so many of our everyday products. It allows people to make a, a personal connection to something on here. There are shoes, there's chalk, there's makeup, there's um, corn products like um, corn oils, spark plugs. Who knew that corn was part of a spark plug? You might also be surprised to learn that food production generates about 25 percent of greenhouse gas emissions. But you can see the unique ways farmers are helping to offset carbon emissions through alfalfa. Alfalfa roots can extend as far as 12 feet deep into the earth, and the plant is incredible at storing carbon. The entire exhibit is interactive. For measuring how you stack up to alfalfa roots and seeing what it would be like to farm in an urban setting, to feeling how much weight different types of food produce in carbon dioxide. Beef, for example, a two ounce piece of beef produces the equivalent of 18 pounds of carbon dioxide. Our goal from the very beginning was to create an exhibit where people can read about interesting ideas if they like to read, where if they need to physically experience something to get an idea across that they can do that as well. There's also a section dedicated to local chefs that highlights how they use food in their everyday life and how it connects to their culture. I think one of the most impactful parts of the exhibit is what tastes like home where people can put their ideas up on the exhibit. They can they can leave their ideas and their their answer to the question what tastes like home. The Cultivate exhibit will be at the Botanic Garden at least through the end of the year, but it has been such a success, it may get extended. But no matter how you're getting your food, it is inevitable that some of it will go to waste. But what you do with your food scraps can make a big difference in methane emissions. But there is a very simple solution to this and one that I am personally very passionate about. Composting. It is so much easier and much less disgusting than you may think. Food waste takes up more space in U.S. landfills than anything else. And when your wasted food sits in a landfill, it generates methane, a big contributor to climate change. So instead of throwing it away, compost it. We made a composter this weekend using a 32-gallon round trash can and a drill. We made the holes about a half an inch in diameter. Drill 20 to 30 holes on the bottom so you have plenty of drainage. Then you'll move on to the side, drilling those holes about 5 inches apart. Make sure you remove any loose plastic after drilling. 
putting plastic back into the earth kind of counterintuitive. Then you'll start your compost. Add a little garden soil, dried up yard waste, and food scraps. Yum! We collect food scraps in a special can under the sink throughout the week and then dump it into the composter when it gets full. Next, you'll secure your lid, put it on real tight. I gave it a little shake. Totally not necessary, but hey, it felt right in the moment. Then you'll place it out of sight, preferably on dirt, and get to composting. And one year after composting our food waste, the bin still hadn't filled up, and we put that nutrient-rich soil right into our garden bed. Now, maybe you're watching this saying, but I live in an apartment or I don't have room for a composter. Think again. A lot of cities and towns across the DMV have curbside composting programs where you can leave your compost bin at the curb just like you would a trash can. The city of Alexandria just launched one. Check it out. The greater DC area generates 700,000 tons of food waste each year, and the vast majority of that is still being thrown in the trash where it generates methane gas and contributes to climate change. And now it's easier for Alexandria residents to do their part in protecting the environment. I like to encourage people to think of food as a resource. Uh, so when you compost, you're adding that resource back into the environment. The pilot is open to 2,000 residents in Alexandria, and it will run for two years. So far, a little over 500 residents are signed up. Residents are just excited to get started with it. Um, I think that they've been waiting for something like this for a long time, so it's a great opportunity. The city is making it easy by providing a seven gallon collection bin and educational materials to get started. You're already throwing that food waste away in your trash. So what we're asking you to do is just place it in a separate bin, put it in a separate bag, and place it at the curb. Residents who participate get a compost okay, kickback from Compost Crew, the company responsible for collecting food waste and taking it to a larger facility in Prince George's County, where this turns into this. We will deliver residents who want it a bag of compost, and they can use that in their gardens, on their lawns. They can you know, use that and help contribute to the health of the local soil. This pilot is just for household residents, but for people who live in apartments, there are six free drop-off locations available on the weekend. And DC just launched a pilot program as well. For more information on how you can sign up or to find food compost drop-off locations across the DMV, just visit our WUSA 9 app. And let's not forget, there are a ton of ways to reduce the amount of food waste you create in the first place. First, check your fridge and freezer before going to the store. You might not need all of the food that's on your list. Plan your meals out. This helps tremendously with overbuying and overspending. And utilize your leftovers. Get creative. Throw leftover chicken in with your salad. If a banana is feeling mushy, freeze it for a smoothie. Or veggies that feel a little soft can actually be great for a stir fry. And make sure you're storing your food properly. This goes for leftovers and food you buy from the store and bring home and know what to keep in the fridge and what actually lasts longer if it sits on the counter and understand date labels. Sell by or best buy are general indicators of when a food will be at its peak quality, but oftentimes they're perfectly fine well beyond that date. If it looks fine and smells fine, it's probably fine. Whether you're commuting to work or traveling across the country, the way you get from point A to point B can have a big impact on the environment. Let's start local. DC's Metro is one of the busiest public transportation systems in the country. And while we know it has its quirks and isn't always smooth sailing, more often than not, you'd be surprised at how much quicker and cheaper it can be than driving. For example, let's say you want to go from here at WUSA 9 in Upper Northwest to Reagan National Airport. To drive the eight miles can take anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes depending on traffic. But then you have to park your car, which starts at $19 per day and of course the cost of gas. A rideshare option would take the same amount of time, but cost roughly $30 to $45 depending on traffic and surge pricing. To take the Metro could take you about 45 to 50 minutes when you factor in the walk to the Metro, waiting for the Metro, connecting stops, and getting to the airport. 
but it only costs you two to six dollars and your carbon footprint is significantly less. And if you're trying to get somewhere the Metro doesn't service, you can take one of Metro's 325 bus routes for just a dollar and 75 cents per ride. There's also the DC Circulator, which has seven routes serving popular destinations like Georgetown, Union Station, the National Mall and even Roslyn, Virginia. It costs just one dollar to ride and arrives every 10 minutes. Getting people to use bicycles for transportation. Um, it's very important for, you know, for the environment, for the health reasons, uh, to relieve congestions and air quality. All of those things are important. And you know the saying, it's like riding a bike. You might be surprised to know how easy it is to ride a bike in the district. DC ranked in the top 10 for 2022 on the list of most bike friendly cities in the United States, clocking in at seventh place. DC is applauded for its accessibility to bike share options, over 150 miles of bike lanes and trails, and ease of commuting on a bike. Did you know that you can just wheel your bike onto the metro and all DC buses have bike racks? And in less than 10 years, the DC Department of Transportation has installed nearly 3,000 bike racks. Now, what about the bigger picture? Traveling by plane and taking trips abroad. There are ways to make your trips more sustainable. I spoke to Matt Berna, the president and managing director of Intrepid Travel, a sustainable travel company that was recently named in Time's top 100 list of influ influential companies. You might look at the type of holiday you're going on. So an active holiday, let's say like cycling or a walking vacation, is typically human powered therefore has much lower carbon footprints. That's one great way you can do it. If you're traveling overseas, think about traveling internally with trains and ferries instead of in, in uh, domestic flights. And it's a great way to meet locals. It's much more enjoyable. You can see the scenery. So again, local transport is very important to traveling more sustainably. Probably the most important thing you can do is when you're traveling somewhere, visiting somewhere, buy local, shop local, stay local, drink local, because those funds and the distribution of what you're spending locally is staying in that economy and helping support those local communities. So spending locally is really important for us. Matt also recommended traveling less frequently for a longer duration of time. And he said you can also look into carbon offsetting programs when booking flights and finding accommodations. Now that we've covered dozens of ways that you can reduce your personal carbon footprint, let's talk about why it's so important to do so. While a large majority of greenhouse gas emissions come from major oil companies and large producers, our individual actions do matter. And thanks to funding like the Inflation Reduction Act, living greener is becoming easier and more feasible. According to a study out of Princeton University, roughly 30% of emission reductions as a result of the bill expected over the next decade will come from people like you and me switching to electric vehicles and finding cleaner sources of energy to heat our homes and power our appliances. It will add up. So while actions like tossing your banana peel in the composter or riding your bike to dinner instead of hopping in an Uber might not feel like it matters, it does. And what will make an even bigger difference is educating others on these important topics. Talk about it at dinner. Encourage your friends to make these small changes. Influence the next generation to make environmentally friendly decisions. Living greener really isn't hard. It's just a choice you have to make because our environment matters. I'm meteorologist Caitlin McGrath. I'll see you next time.